Oh, this too, if you'd like to. I'm going to give you a brief annual report. Uh, the year has been an exciting one, as usual, something happening all the time. Uh, started off with our famous antique show, which we held in May, and despite the fact that the number of vendors perhaps were fewer, plus the number of patrons was down this past year, we still turned to profit, and we plan to uh, hold another antique show next May, and then we are currently negotiating a contract, so that should follow. Our flea market, on the other hand, uh, had to give way to Mother Nature, and by about 10.30 or 11 o'clock, the vendors had long disappeared. They couldn't take the rain, and I can't say I blame them. But Sylvia Berry has made arrangements for the one coming next September to be either held outdoors if the weather is nice, or it will be held inside here in the center so that we will not lose our event entirely. This year we had very interesting programs that we have given throughout the year. Chuck Collins on Connecticut Wildlife and Michael McBride, who was with us recently, do, doing a program on Bethany and Woodbridge in the Civil War. And Muffy German is to be thanked for arranging these. Our Sunday open house, which we hold each Sunday from May until October, from 2 to 4. We had a lot of visitors this summer, and it was very interesting. And I have to apologize for not getting our <coughs> tool display in order so that we could open it to the public. However, it is going to hopefully be open when we open in May again next year. Which brings me to the subject of volunteers. Uh, we need volunteers for our Sundays at the Darling House and particularly if we open the tool display because we are going to need people within the house to act as guides as well as people in the barn with the tool display. And we are going to start a guide tutoring program uh, so that perhaps we can familiarize more people with the wonderful things that we have at the Darling House and people won't be as timid to be guides for us because if we don't get them, our house is going to be vacant without tourists and as will our tool display. So we would like any volunteers that might like to come forward or as we organize the program better, we may be volunteering some of you if you would please help us out. Uh, we've had several liaisons this year to various committees within the area. Don Menzies <coughs> has, is on the Historic District Study Committee and we have had various people attend at request the Public Owned Properties Commission. So we have been doing other things than the Darling House. And two people are here tonight that I want to thank very much for keeping our Darling House in good shape are the Mallinson, Sandy and Keith Mallinson, who are our caretakers. And they have done a wonderful job, and we are enjoying them, and I hope they are enjoying us. The last but not least is our holiday party and our open house was great success last year, and we are going to have it again this year on the 5th of December from 2 to 4. We will have music, we will have people performing, and also our carol singing, and goodies and good fellowship. Muffy German, who did a wonderful display for us on uh, Thomas Darling that was in the Woodbridge Library earlier this year, is going to recreate her display for us at, for the party and we thank her. I think at this point, I would like to thank everybody who has been supportive of me, and it has made my time as president on the board a very pleasant experience, and I couldn't have done it without everybody's help. And at this time, I would like to call on Muffy German, I believe, to read our nominating committee. The um, slate is as follows. For President Don Menzies, Vice President Wilson Kimnock, Recording Secretary Elaine Allen, Treasurer Stuart Peck, Corresponding Secretary Hope Snyder, 
Pat, uh, and past president to be is L.A. Jones. For directors with terms expiring in 1996, Polly Schultz, Sylvia Berry, Bunny Yesner, and Mary Dean. Thank you very much. Uh, Alan Dean was chairman of this committee and unable to be with us this evening. And his committee was consisted of Muffy German and Hope Snyder. Are there any further nominations from the floor? If not, I would like to ask for someone to make a motion to accept the slate as presented. So moved. Second? I second the motion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The slate has passed. And at this time, Mr. Menzies, <laughs> my good and faithful servant <laughs> for two years. <laughs> now I can go backwards and help you. I'm not sure I like this gleam in her eye. <laughs> good help, and I'm sure you will be very successful. Not Thank very you. The first question is, how do you get it lit? No. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You'll have to figure it out. Well, thank you all very much. Um, a couple of firsts. It's kind of interesting. I don't know exactly how long it's been since there's been a male president of the Historical Society, but I think it was Reverdy Whitlock, and that puts it back a decade or two. Uh, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. It's just something I realized last week. Um, it's also kind of interesting to note that I'm probably the first president to have only resided in Woodbridge less than one year. The, uh, rolled down Carrington Hill, as it were, in February, and landed in front of the old Bishop Place, uh, just south of the Darling House, where Dana and our two girls and I live now. Uh, but it's only been since February, so I haven't really been a resident in a year yet. And as far as what we're going to be doing next year, which is different from things we've been doing in the past, we're trying something new. Uh, it's kind of a big event. It's not a new idea. It's actually an idea that one of our most loved and trusted and respected board members has had for years. And uh, so on our, sometime in or around July, you know, I want you to be on the lookout for the, what we're going to call the first annual Mary Walton's Picnic. And uh, it's, it's an idea that Mary has had for years. She's always wanted to do it. It seemed like a great idea to me when I first heard about it years ago. And now that I have some clout, <laughs> well, we're going to give it a try. I don't know whether it's going to work, but I figured nothing ventured, nothing gained. It, it hasn't really come together yet, um, but we're hoping for uh, the event to be at the Darling House, on the grounds, uh, box lunch, entertainment for kids, for adults, maybe some music, tours of the house, people able to use the trails that um, wind around behind the Darling House up against West Rock. Uh, open the house for tours and the tool barn will be ready by then and it could be a really great community time for everybody and that's what we're hoping for. That's going to start um, being worked on with committees in January at our first meeting and hopefully we'll decide on a date sometime around July 4th uh, but that's all to be determined. Anyhow that's our big venture for next year and I hope you'll all be on the lookout for it. Uh, the other thing uh, Ellie sort of touched upon that I think you all should know and that's um, the, the business of this historic district committee. Um, we are a committee appointed by the town. Um, Russ Stoddard is here, he's on the committee with us. Uh, and we are uh, working on Litchfield Turnpike from Bond Road to the Bethany Town Line uh, and getting that historic district status with an ordinance. Um, and we're having the state of Connecticut work with us on this, working very closely with us, which has been very good. Uh, we are this Sunday having a a tea at the Darling House. The Historical Society is, is hosting it for the members, the people who live within the district who uh, would be affected by it, to answer their questions, uh, alleviate any fears they might have, and to uh, just present the, the whole idea of the district and, and what it entails. As an offshoot of this, though, and the really exciting part to me is that the state of Connecticut has come to the, the committee and said, there has never been a survey of the old homes of Woodbridge, Connecticut. Most other towns have been done, either WPA or their own local um, volunteer efforts. They've surveyed all the old homes in town. Apparently, this has never been done in Woodbridge. The state has said we would like to get that survey done. We have money available uh, in terms of matching grants. So we are soliciting funds from different organizations in the town of Woodbridge, uh, 
uh, a number of them, including I believe the Conservation Commission and the Amity Woodbridge Historical Society, have come forward to pledge $1,000 a piece, which will be matched by the state. Uh, we hope to get a total of $4,000 in cash matched by the state with another $4,000, and then some other uh, monies made up at, in what they call work in kind, uh, where people volunteer their service and it counts as money towards paying a consultant to do this this survey of all the old homes. We're thinking about 150 houses, and the cost is on or around 50 or 55 dollars a house. But what this means is we will now have um, something about every old house, every old building, and every old site, or most of them, that are uh, around the Woodbridge or like the sites where things used to be. And that means that maybe someday we can finally come out with a major work of all the old homes, homes in Woodbridge, and that would be a major, major undertaking. But with this what survey, date would you start on that for all your houses? Um, nothing would really start to happen until next year. No, I mean, we're, how far oh, back would As far go? back as we can go. I, the idea is to survey all and the houses. And where would you cut it off? <laughs> at, probably at a, a number of houses and sites. In other words, when we get up to 150, we might have to stop due to funding constraints. Because mm -hmm. I know that there's at least three very old houses on both. Oh yes, so like I said, all the early ones would certainly be included. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I'm finding out, even as a fairly new resident of Woodbridge, uh, not of Amity Parish per se, but of Woodbridge, is that there are some great caches of old homes throughout town. Oh yeah. Uh, there's just all those that didn't burn down. Right. <laughs> so we hope to get this survey underway. Uh, <laughs> Any questions? Do you have any thought about perhaps utilizing the high school students to be part of this? project around the survey to see what they might be able to do to assist your Yeah, efforts. well, volunteers, definitely. Uh, we really haven't gotten that far yet with the state. I think what we do, and I may be wrong, but I think what we do is we select a consultant from a list of consultants that the state gives us and then start working with that person. And then we figure out how we're going to achieve this work in kind, and that's where volunteer help comes in. And uh, high school students would be outstanding. I have one myself. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of irons in the fire. Uh, as Ellie said, don't forget the annual open house um, on, su on Sunday, December 5th. That's always a great time. Tonight, a Woodbridge farm through the centuries uh, is a collaborative effort. Uh, it wasn't advertised that way in the paper, and that was my fault because I put the ad in. But it's been a good number of hours. I'd say Bob, Brenton, and I have worked a good 40 hours total on preparing this slideshow for you tonight. Uh, we've used manuscripts, photographs, and the actual tools of the trade, uh, all at the Darling House, pretty much. All things that we've uh, acquired through the acquisition of the house and, and grounds. And I think that Bob and I have both come out of this, the research end of this, uh, with a lot of unanswered questions, as you always do when you enter into something like this. But even though we haven't answered all the questions, we feel like we've gotten um, a much clearer idea of the dynamics of the Thomas Darwin farm throughout the centuries. Its evolution and de-evolution, if you will, and that, or it's almost a cyclic kind of thing which we didn't realize before. Um, it came, it went, it came, it went. Um, but even though the Darling name appears on the first Woodbridge Grand List of 1784, and the Darling name continues to appear there until 1905 when the last surviving Darling dies, I think you'll see how the farm has outlived even the Darling name uh, right up to the present day. Um, and it should be very interesting. Bob Brinton, I'm sure most of you in this room know him as well as I do, but for the few of you who perhaps don't, I would characterize Bob as a, a man of many hats. And I don't mean that he collects them. <laughs> and he's not wearing one now. But he... He has a lot of um, a lot of things going on. Um, he is a lifelong Bethany resident. He's been he's on many commissions and boards in that town, uh, and has the the great distinction of being the town historian in Bethany. Uh, he's on the board of directors for the West Rock Ridge Park Association and on their advisory council. He has a vested interest in West Rock and loves it uh, as much as he loves his town. Um, I'm sure I'm going to not get all the committees he's on, and that's not important. But uh, as, as far as we're concerned with the Historical Society, he is the Building and Grounds Committee, a veritable committee of one. Uh, and I'm sure you all know by just driving by the house and the good shape it's in that he's doing his job well there. 
Um, aside from that, he was my next door neighbor for 12 years and a very good friend. So with that, Robert, I'll turn it over to you. Sit down. You can use those for looking at Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Glad to see you all. Uh, tonight's talk is going to be about a Woodbridge farm through the uh, centuries, and we're really talking about uh, a little over two centuries. Uh, we're all familiar with the, Dar the Thomas Darling house and a little bit uh, with Thomas Darling himself. But not much has been done on the house and the farm subsequent to the death of Thomas Darling. And we're going to talk a little bit about Thomas Darling tonight, but uh, I want to point out that there have been five talks over the years on Thomas Darling's life. Thomas Darling uh, was born in 1720, moved to New Haven in 1722. He really spent most of his life in New Haven. He didn't come out to uh, Woodbridge until he was getting along in years, about my age. <laughs> and uh, when he did come out and set up a farm, he, he only lived there in the, in the house for 15 years. Most people don't realize that because they associate the house with the building. But out of the two centuries, or over two centuries, he lived there just about 15 years. Uh, the very first talk on Thomas Darling was given in 1940 by Lucy Finney, the originator or one of the um, originators of the society. Uh, the next three talks were given uh, by Carol Means, and the most recent one was given by Andy German. So that, that comes out, I think, to five, if I'm not mistaken. I w I'm holding this because um, if you want to find out more about Thomas Darling, an extremely interesting um, 18th century individual, uh, the society has published this book, and it is available for sale. Um, tonight. That's the, that's the end of our uh, commercial. <laughs> All right, uh, does anybody know how to turn off lights? And uh, Don, you want to operate the, get the machine going? Will, you're going to do that. Bob, you're going to do the audio. Or is the audio on? Okay. I'm not too good at handling the technical aspect, so uh, we need the younger generation for that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. We're not afraid of the dark. <laughs> well, we're starting off with uh, a photograph of the Thomas Darling house, pretty much as, as, as it is today. Um, you probably will have difficulty seeing this particular uh, uh, view of the house, and that's because uh, this photo, like all the photos that you're going to see tonight, were taken by our new president. Uh, however, he took this one from a tree. Am I correct, John? Yes. yes. He climbed a tree to get this one. Uh, he, he uh, becoming president tonight, he's going out on a limb again. <laughs> Let me get my uh, answer here and we'll get some. Thomas Darling, as I mentioned, uh, came to New Haven as a young man. Uh, we don't know much about his youth. He attended uh, Yale College and uh, studied uh, for the ministry, although he never became a minister. He graduated, became a tutor. He taught uh, Ezra Stiles, for instance. When he in his last year as a tutor, and he was tutor for several years, he was presented this fine coin silver bowl, which was inscribed uh, to him. Same time, about the same year, 1745, he married uh, Abigail Noyes and lived in New Haven. This is, uh, his, this is his parents, <coughs> Susanna and Samuel Dowling. Uh, in New Haven, he was involved, uh, not in the ministry, but uh, certainly in political matters. Uh, he was a justice of the peace. 
He was interested in a number of uh, ventures that involved uh, trade, went into business, uh, trading both wholesale and retail. He was in, uh, in partnership uh, in this kind of business as well. Uh, he was involved, and this is one of his most successful uh, ventures, was a rope walk. And for those of you who've been to Mystic, there's part of the rope walk restored there. It's a long building, and it was designed to manufacture rope. This particular uh, map from the 19, from the 1830s uh, shows the rope walk as a very long shed. Uh, you'll notice it's over a city block long. If you notice Grand Avenue, Green Street, if you're, anyone's familiar with the Worcester Square area, you know that that is a, cons a building of considerable length. He didn't own it at this time, but it still existed. And it was one of his most successful ventures because rope in the 18th century was an extremely valuable commodity. Every farmer needed rope. Every mariner needed rope. It was uh, a one thing that you could use very often instead of money to uh, settle your debts because it was universally needed. By the way, the rope walk, the site of the rope walk presently is St. John Street in New Haven. Uh, the, uh, yes, this is the Boston Massacre, the famous, uh, <coughs> uh, famous cut by uh, Paul Revere. A little bit of uh, propaganda, and very successful propaganda. I put this here just to remind you that uh, Thomas Darling, who was prospering to some extent in various business ventures uh, during the 1740s, 50s, and 60s, uh, didn't move out, as I mentioned, to, new, to uh, Amity until later in his life. Why did he do it? We don't really know. We know, uh, my theory is, and this is why this is here, my theory is he was very conservative, tended to be kind of a Tory, and uh, he thought that maybe it would be a good idea to get away from some of the tensions that uh, were uh, prevalent in New Haven as in other cities prior to the Revolutionary War. And so he wended his way to his family northward through Westville. We're, we're looking toward West Rock here. And uh, north into areas that had been uh, formerly Sperry lands. As a matter of fact, he had bought lands from the Sperry family uh, years earlier. And here he made his home, the present site of the Darling House. In 1772, uh, he started construction of a house at this location. This is an interesting map. It's the earliest map, manuscript map we have in the Darling uh, Family Papers collection. Manuscript maps are extremely uh, rare, and, and we have a number of them. The reason we have a number of them is both Thomas's, Thomas Darling's son and grandson were surveyors. They did their own. They did their own work. This particular map is, uh, I believe, uh, late 18th century. That this may be from 1790. The reason I say that is there is no Litchfield Turnpike here. It doesn't show. Doesn't show a road. It does show in meticulous detail, uh, but you can't see the rest of the farm, uh, 150 or 200 acres. Uh, he shows the house that was built, says house, there's a house. And this is the interesting part, old house. There was an earlier house on the property that belonged to, uh, I think, the grandson of Richard Sperry, original settler of, uh, of this area. And uh, when Thomas Darling purchased the property, he built right in front of the uh, existing house. This house, we believe, Occupy the site of what is today the uh, chicken coop in the back of the Darling House. This is probably pretty much what the Darling House looked like in Thomas <coughs> Darling's time. Uh, we selected this particular photo because it uh, eliminates more most of the later additions and uh, Victorian.
framework that, uh, except for, of course, the fence, this is a later period. But the rest of what you see there is pretty much what Thomas Darling would have seen. It's a handsome house. It's a, it's, this is not a typical Woodbridge house. This is a house that was built by someone later in life who had achieved some prosperity and uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, a great deal of um, recognition. This is a man that had been involved in politics in New Haven. He had been, uh, he had run for mayor of New Haven. This is somebody who communicated, wrote letters to Benjamin Franklin and, uh, and the like. This is not a typical farmer's house. Ceilings are nine feet tall. Very unusual. You're not gonna find many, I don't know if there's another 18th century house in Woodbridge that would have had nine foot ceilings. Another thing it had, uh, which you can't see in this particular photograph, but you will see later, is it had twin chimneys, which means it had the center hall, this door facing south, which allowed a greater number of fireplaces than you, than you would be able to find in a center chimney house. Characteristically, a center chimney house, uh, you would get uh, far fewer fireplaces. This house had eight fireplaces. Extremely unusual. Uh, not long after the house was built, it was hit by lightning. And uh, we, we presume that uh, since Darling was, uh, according to letters that were found in the house, uh, conversant with uh, some of Benjamin Franklin's teachings uh, or findings about uh, scientific matters, uh, the one we're most familiar with is uh, his interest in glass making. Uh, that was one of the thoughts that uh, Thomas had that he went to the glass making business. He never did. Uh, <clears throat> but the house was hit by lightning and we think that as a result of that, shortly after 1777, this very early lightning rod was put on and it still survived. You can see a, a, just a, a brief view of uh, what Thomas Darling's house may have looked like. Uh, this particular room in the house has some of the earliest furniture that, that uh, survives. Uh, according to, to tradition, this, was not on, this chair not only belonged to Thomas Darling, but was his favorite chair. This early clock, Brassworks clock, uh, we believe probably was made in New Haven and probably belonged to Thomas Darling. Uh, when Don Menzies went through the tax records, and go through the tax records he did, uh, from 1784 until 1950, one of the things he did was trace the ownership of uh, what we think is this clock. By the way, Don, if I make any mistakes, uh, we'll give you five minutes for rebuttal at the end. <laughs> Almost as soon as the house was built, perhaps even earlier, barns were required. Very important to house your animals because this was going to be a working farm. And, uh, and, and what? This is a, a scene of a barn raising. Uh, I was lucky enough to get this. This is a much later barn raising. Uh, actually, you'll be surprised to learn that this was taken in 1908. A uh, barn that was being put up on Amity Road um, by, um, uh, you see the second bend going up. This is Ida Vestal's old house. Uh, to the back of the salt box there. Wil uh, Wilbur Longs is the Wilbur Longs family who was a building. He's putting one of the fence there that was put up. I just put this in here to show you how some of the construction would have taken place for this very early barn. This barn, in my opinion, uh, dates from the 18th century. It has a, uh, an oak frame rather than the chestnut that's found later in the 19th century. Probably the earliest outbuilding on the property. Yes. Um, yes, it was. Um, <clears throat> this was a decision that was made because it's probably uh, more authentic. We assume that these barns originally were red. As a matter of fact, we do have some barn boards that have red paint on them. Surprisingly enough, you're going to find out in a while that not only were the barns red, but the house was red. Red was an extremely popular paint in the 18th century. We have a, a photograph of a house when it was painted red in the 1870s. And if you 
uh, had been at the house this winter when we had a little leak, which caused the section of original clapboards on the porch to peel. You find that all of the white paint came off, and there was a nice bright red uh, left over from uh, the very earliest paint that was put on. Uh, this is just to indicate the kind of conditions. This actually was a uh, in that photo was in the 18th century, but in the Darling House collection, we happen to find this photo uh, that shows some uh, land clearing taking place at the Woodbridge Orchards property on Newton Road. But uh, probably, except for the attire, the uh, the technology of clearing the land, the Darling property was was probably not very much different from this. Uh, maybe you would have had to pair of horses there, could have been oxen, tipped cart, and uh, bars, sledges, and a lot of muscles. We, we think that probably Thomas Darling wasn't doing this kind of work. As a little sidebar here, having not done much in this property, uh, but I did, did dig a couple of post holes a few years back to put up the, the sign for the Thomas Darling house, which you'll see later and I encountered nothing but rocks. That, a few inches under the ground there was absolutely nothing but rocks. There. The materials that we used, especially Don used, in uh, determining what kind of agricultural activities were taking place at various points in time, and also uh, materials that enabled him to gain some knowledge of the ownership of the property, were the uh, com almost complete collection of brand lists from 1784 to 1950 that are stored in the Darling House at this time. This happens to be 1784. Beautiful writing. Unfortunately, I didn't learn to write like that in school. And remember, this was probably done with a quill pen. The, um, this is typical of the, how many did you go through, Don? Um, 17, well, 17, over a over hundred of these you went through, didn't you? Obviously. Uh, this gives you an idea of what's going on here in 1784. It happens to be the earliest one we have in our collection. Uh, Thomas Darling, our builder, he has two oxen. Fifteen and a half cows. We're not sure what you do with a half a cow. <laughs> we know what a side of beef is, but I don't know exactly how you milk a half a cow. Uh, three and a half horses. Well, I don't think that we have a half horse, half cow here, but uh, what may have happened is he may have owned a share with someone else. We don't know. Uh, as Don pointed out, research is in my experience with research is interesting uh, in that. I've always found that for every question you, ask, you answer through research, you create two more. That's the old uh, one step forward, two steps back idea. Uh, he has what, how many acres there? Is that uh, 300? About 300 acres. Uh, there's the clock. We don't understand why there's salt meadow there unless the uh, sea level was higher there that time. 1790 was the uh, first census of the United States. We started counting who was where. Uh, this is, uh, of course, finds uh, Tom Starling uh, had expired by this time. And the census lists Abigail. And uh, those of you who know the house probably know that at one time in the early days there were a number of slaves on the property. And uh, Thomas had freed some of the slaves, but in, in the 1790 census, it lists for Abigail, four slaves were living in that house in 1790. Now to give you an idea of the uh, how he fits into the rest of the area, uh, I quickly looked through the 1790 census for all of Amity, that's the Bethany Woodbridge area. In the entire Bethany Woodbridge area, there were 14 slaves, of which four, four of them were on the Darling property. Thomas dies in 1789, and 
He is succeeded by his son Thomas. This is very confusing. And then he has a grandson, Thomas. Uh, we're going to call uh, we're going to call Thomas uh, Junior or Thomas the Second. And uh, he inherits the uh, property. And he is a surveyor, among other things. He certainly is a farmer, but he's also a surveyor. And he makes trips. As a matter of fact, we have a, if I'm not mistaken, we have a uh, diary of his where he tells of traveling to Vermont and surveying out towns in Vermont, a number of towns. There is a, definitely a Vermont connection here. When Thomas Darling died, we have a, a copy of his uh, inventory. He owned, he owned land in Vermont, in several, several areas in Vermont. I don't know if he's what. Lots of questions. This is another map. This is both of the both the early map and, and this slightly later map, which probably was made about 1800, are are manuscript maps that were done by Thomas Jr. Uh, we know that it's after uh, 1797 because we have the Straits Turnpike Road, and we're going to be saying a lot more about the Straits Turnpike later on. Straits Turnpike is literally central to the Darling property. Geographically it's central because it divides the property, but it also involves many generations of Darlings. Uh, I want to point out two other things about this. The old house is still there, but it's not listed as an old house. Uh, for the first time, a porch appears on the, west, on the western side of the Darling house. It's not the porch you see now, the porch you see now may have been the third porch. We're not sure. This I did want to call attention to one, to, uh, one more item, and that's the mill. And at this early period, a cider mill is located on the property. As a matter of fact, uh, probably the cider mill goes back to the original Thomas Darling's time because it appears in the early map uh, that <coughs> probably... Uh, coincided with his lifetime. Today, this, the area north of the, what we call the horse barn, the little field where we used to have our flea markets and tag sales, uh, I once uh, taped off the location of the mill. I can't remember where it is anymore. But the mill was located just above in this area. And we have, in the Darling uh, Papers, a record of some of the sales of cider. And a tremendous amount of cider was made in this mill in the early days by evidently several generations of Darwin's. Very difficult to read. Uh, I guess that's probably an understatement. But uh, these, this is uh, again from the, from the uh, archives of the uh, Thomas Darling House. Uh, we have a list of earmarks, Woodbridge. Uh, Thomas Darling, and this is the earmark for his creatures is a hole in the left ear. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of agriculturally <coughs> related. Uh, in those days, if your animal strayed, the only way you could get your animal back was to be able to identify it, and you identified it by a particular uh, marking in the ear, and this was something that was required. Back to the Turnpike. Uh, another early manuscript map. Survey of the Straits Turnpike Road. Uh, and the Shunpike from fork to fork. I'm only showing you this, the uh, lower half of the map here. Uh, this is a manuscript map, or this is actually taken from a manuscript map. Again, made by Thomas Darling Jr. Dated 1817, I believe, yes. Uh, it's extremely uh, useful. It shows, uh, I kind of like this. This shows, it says the greatest distance road to road. And uh, it tells the number of rods. And I actually scaled it out and was able to locate a couple of things using that scale. Uh, this is, for those of you who uh, want to be oriented here, this is Pond Lully. It's a gate, that's a toll gate probably just north of uh, 
present-day Bradley Road. Bond Road probably hooks off here. That was the old county road, which doesn't show on here anymore. This is Straits Turnpike Road, and this says Shunpike. That's where you went when you didn't want to pay toll. I don't know if any of you people have ever gone around toll gates. <laughs> I've heard of it happen. <laughs> and this greatest distance, uh, Downs Road is probably here, and this is the area we used to call Dead Man's Curve. Now it's been eliminated. But it goes back to the 1790s. Uh, Thomas Darling Jr. here in 1810 uh, owned shares in the Straits Turnpike Company. Also, he was the clerk of the Straits Turnpike Company. And for this reason, anytime that people had monies coming in to the Turnpike, which was a joint stock company, uh, or going out of the Turnpike, being paid out, they went through him. And because the Darlings didn't throw things away, uh, we still have thousands of documents relating to the Litchfield Turnpike. We have records of the tolls that were kept by the toll keepers. Uh, we have records of tools that were bought or repaired. Uh, days of work with uh, oxen and men. This is just one example of such documents. Uh, Thomas uh, Jr. Uh, dies in 1815. And now the, uh, the waters get a little muddier. Uh, Don's research indicates in a couple of, at a couple of times that what we had always assumed to be the line of succession of the house may not be correct. And we're not going to be able to really verify these uh, suspicions until we do some research with uh, land records. And this may be done to some extent in conjunction with the study associated with the uh, upcoming uh, historic district and the, uh, and the uh, uh, survey of homes that uh, goes along with it. In this case, uh, after Thomas Darling Jr. dies, or the second dies, uh, it appears that instead of passing to Thomas, as it as shows here, it appears that John, an older brother, had the property for about 10 years, from 1815 until his death in 1825. And at that time, it appears that it passes on to Thomas. And the reason is that the house and the much of the property seems to be associated with John rather than Thomas at this time. Uh, a couple of other uh, darlings that we're going to be mentioning is a, an older brother, Noyes, uh, and a younger brother, James. Noyes Darling, first maize breeder, uh, systematic maize breeding began here. There's our darling house. Uh, Noyes Darling, who never owned the house, but was a, uh, a child of Thomas Darling Jr., uh, was obviously born in the house, and uh, wrote a paper in 1844 on an improved strain of corn that he had uh, developed. So this shows that the family, even though they had other interests in uh, surveying, for instance, uh, as did uh, both Thomas II and Thomas III, even though they may have had in, uh, uh, investments in the uh, turnpike, as did both Thomases, II and third. Uh, Farming was still important. This house, which uh, stands north of the Darling House, the old Olson House, um, <laughs> I suppose we should say it's the Polk House today, but it, it's kind of difficult. You know, one of the things about living in a New England town is you never own your own house if you live in an old house. Don, you're going to find that out. You're always going to live in the Bishop House. After you're dead, it's going to be the Menzies House. <laughs> well, that's the one forward. <laughs> At any rate, uh, James Darling uh, built this house, and uh, we're going to find that later on this is uh, this was part of the original Darling farm. We're going to find that this is uh, uh, this property that uh, some of the property of the farm is going to be associated with this house, probably 
rather than being associated with the Darling House. This is Thomas III. Uh, actually, our better, better uh, photo of him is uh, a better shot of him is a way to be a uh, conservator. But uh, and this is his wife, Lucy Newton. Probably around 1840, Don. Don's the expert on this. People were not very happy in 1840, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is difficult to read. Uh, this is 1837, and uh, this is showing, this is Thomas Darling III, am I correct, Don? Yes. Okay. Just keep that gavel there. If I make a mistake, you just throw it out. <laughs> the reason that's hard to read is because it's currently for sale at Whitlock Farm Booksellers in Bethany. I took it out of the case and brought it outside and tried to photograph it. I didn't want to pay $150 for it. So I just wanted to $150? Yeah. And we have how many of these? A hundred of them? Yeah. A hundred and how many of them? Wow, so that's why it's a poor photograph. Okay. Uh, well, we'll forgive you. Uh, uh, there's one of the reasons outside of the fact that uh, Don photographed it uh, under adverse circumstances, but the reason we're showing this here is, uh, you know, those are those turnpike shares. We're into a uh, second generation with the uh, turnpike. I believe uh, he was also involved in a, uh, uh, in a capacity of clerk. Did they buy the shares or did they get them by virtue of the amount of money? Okay, no, the Turnpike was a uh, company, like any joint stock company, uh, people bought shares, they uh, purchased the right of way, they made the improvements to the highway. Um, if you don't know the story of Litchfield Turnpike, which in itself is a whole talk, we can do a whole talk on Litchfield Turnpike, and I'm sure that's something Don will want to do with us in the there's plenty of material for a whole evening on the turnpike. The turnpike was designed to be an improved road between the New Haven Courthouse and the Litchfield Courthouse. And when I say between courthouse and courthouse, I mean literally that. It went right across the green, the shortest distance. And it had a number of toll gates. There was one, as I said, just north of uh, Bradley Road, uh, the one in Bethany, uh, right near the intersection of present day Route 63 and Route 42. There was a toll gate there. The income from these tolls paid dividends to the stockholders and paid for the upkeep of the road. And the road had to be uh, maintained. Bridges always washed out. This is a picture of a uh, probably a 19th century turnpike bridge. Uh, road uh, ditches had to be maintained. Mr. Stoddard probably knows something about the difficulty of maintaining roads. Uh, I think Robert Frost said that there's something there is that doesn't want a wall. I think roads are included in that. <laughs> this particular bridge I put in here because it's a, it, it crosses the brook that uh, goes along the south border of the Darling property and into the West River. It forms just about the south boundary of the property with the property that previously uh, was the Eleone Clark property. Uh, the old house is a tavern. Dr. Kane lives there now. I guess we can move through. We'll build 20th century for a while. Uh, I'm kind of interested in this because that's an early bridge and people don't realize this old stone bridge is still what holds Litchfield Turnpike up. When you're coming north from Clark Road, that's what the trailer trucks are still going over. Uh, in front of the Ileone Clark House are two surviving turnpike uh, markers, and these indicated the distances to the New Haven Green and to the uh, Litchfield Green. Uh, the Litchfield one is kind of uh, damaged. This is the better one, which is New Haven. Why it says X minus V, I don't know. It's supposed to be five miles. I think if I were doing it, I would have just put a V, but maybe somebody can figure out figure out why uh, what this notation means. It's a mystery to me. Okay, uh, we've been going kind of chronologically, and uh, at this point, we're going to stop the clock, something that we like to do, uh, if we really could do it. But we're going to stop the clock for the next... Uh, 
few slides. And uh, we're going to look at what farming was like during the period that the Darling House and farm were in the hands of Thomas Darling III and his wife uh, Lucy, uh, Lucy. This was uh, pretty much from 1825 to 1873. <coughs> You know, that just brackets the middle of the 19th century. How did people farm in the mid 19th century? What were they doing? So instead of telling you how many cows they had in each year and pouring into debt, we're going to look at this. This, ha this map happens to be from uh, 1868, Beers Atlas of uh, New Haven County. And uh, there's your T. Darling. You know that that's, uh, that's got to be Thomas Darling III. There's the uh, does that say Old Litchfield Turnpike? Yeah. Yeah. Old Litchfield Turnpike, okay. Uh, and the West River. The east boundary line was the summit of West Rock. I don't think that big pine tree is there anymore. <laughs> this, uh, this charcoal, undated charcoal uh, rendering of the house also by an unknown author, is just kind of charming, and it, it gives us a, a kind of look of, of what it might have, must have been like in the mid-19th century on the uh, Darling Farm. The uh, West Rock in the background, the turnpike just out of sight here. A few cows. We have to give Don credit here. This is his second tree that he climbed. This is, this is a, it's, it's an actually beautiful photograph. It was taken just a few days ago. Uh, you sure you want a president who climbs trees? <laughs> How high did you have to go here, Don? Um, I think I'm about 20 feet up. 20 feet up. Uh, an immoderate height, if I ever heard one. But, uh, it, it gives you a view that you otherwise couldn't get. Uh, the corn stubble in the, in the foreground, the old barns in the house in West Rock. <coughs> it, it, it just epitomizes what the house probably looked like in the 20th century. He's managed to, to lose all the electric wires and there's no cars going by. So we can kind of imagine that uh, we're stepping back in time. Well, I guess we are stepping back in time. Typical transport in the mid 19th century would be the ox. And this uh, this wonderful picture of the uh, perhaps Pearl Sperry is another story uh, with oxen. Also found uh, your transportation, if not a, with an ox, would be horses. And this is the present horse barn of the Darling House. And for those of you who are not conversant with horse barns. Uh, the way you can tell is by well, look, look the little windows. Every stall had a window. And you can pretty much tell how many stalls the barn was originally designed for. This barn from the 19th century probably it certainly was here at this time. It shows a level of uh, wealth not found in most farms at this time. That a specialized building just for horses and carriages. <coughs> This is the inside of the barn, showing the stalls. Uh, this is our, we have some of the tools for our museum in here, and we're just still in the process of organizing it. All we need is time. Many of the tools you're going to be seeing now uh, were in the house when the society acquired the contents. Uh, some have been donated later, uh, especially a large donation by the uh, Peck family. This, I need that boring machine probably with that. All right, let's uh, talk about some more <laughs> kinds of animals. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the end the milk comes from, remember. Uh, this, this scene, probably in Woodbridge, not on the Darling Farm, probably, but we don't know. This is an untitled one, uh, but it's it's certainly what a barn would have looked like in 1850 uh, or 1900 or 1925 or... Notice how... Well, actually, when I was a kid. <laughs> Notice how carefully that trench is placed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the gutter, by the way. That's cleaned out with a shovel and a uh, wheelbarrow. 
Anybody remember doing that? Yes, I can see it. Associated with a uh, cattle, of course, is this uh, wonderful butter churn from the Darling House kitchen. A uh, nice redware milk can from uh, mid 19th century, would you say, Tom? Sure. He'll say yes to any <laughs> That's right. It's only me that stands between you and the uh, freshman. <laughs> Uh, to keep those uh, critters going, they had to be fueled. Uh, some hay cutting equipment from the Darling House connection, the collection, a uh, side of course, hay saw, and this. You have to notice the length of that uh, hay fork indicates that it was used not just for not for feeding cattle, but for throwing hay up into the hay loft from a wagon. This is a photograph of a little hard to take. Uh, poor Don had to stick his head into the old pig house and uh, was able to take a photograph of this early hand, uh, handmade trough hand, made out of a hollow out log. And this is the chute where the swill would come down. <laughs> Probably we should get through with this long before the uh, <laughs> Uh, but this is still in the Darling, on the Darling property. This is just the way it is today. It never got moved. Uh, we're moving along now to field crops that you'd find in the mid-19th century. This is a very early plow. Uh, certainly from the early part of the 19th century, if not the late part of the 18th century. And this would be pulled by probably by oxen and a very early handmade pull in the uh, tool collection. Uh, borrowed these, this corn from Keith and Sandy without permission. <laughs> we didn't have any other corn, but we needed something to go with a corn cutter and indicate uh, some of the crops that were grown on the farm. In addition to that, grain was very important. This is before grain was brought from the West. Uh, and these tools from the collection again, the, uh, the grain cradle to cut it and, and, and uh, make it suitable for stacking. Um, Flail, which would be used for uh, beating the grain on the threshing floor of the barn, and uh, a nice wooden grain scoop to, to scoop it up. No metal was supposed to touch grain. This is a little later fanning mill, <coughs> later part of the century, and this would enable you to separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were, without resorting to a, a clumsy winnowing basket much, much faster. Uh, this is uh, the only indication we have at this point of uh, fowl on the farm. This is the old chicken coop. Uh, we recently, recently, a few years ago, we did a considerable amount of work to it because we really wanted to save it. I know it's just an old chicken coop, but how many chicken coops are left in Woodbridge? Not many. Uh, the other thing that's important about this is, if you remember from the earlier, uh, the two earliest maps, this is the site of the early uh, Sperry House. And, and this retaining wall that's in, nearly invisible probably was part of the foundation. Bees! Uh, this, this is uh, located on the uh, upper part of the caretaker's quarters, which was originally a kind of a woodshed. And uh, the other part was the summer kitchen, I guess. And this was to allow bees to enter and exit, and you would actually have your hives within the structure. And that survived. Uh, this is suggesting that wool, this is, I guess Mary Walton probably, is not here to see herself, uh, but she'll be here for the picnic, I hope. Uh, indicating the, uh, the use of wool, which was uh, raised on the property, uh, at several occasions, large numbers of sheep uh, were raised. I think the largest number was something like in 1810, there was 70 sheep. Generally not many, but is that correct, Todd? Right. Boy, is he easy tonight. <coughs> elect somebody president and uh, never give you an argument. This is an ice house. Uh, this part of this little shed, as it appears today, these are all current. This is one of the barns we haven't painted red yet. <laughs> Don's going to take care of this part, this painting part. The, uh, this part is, a, uh, is still a ice house. It's got uh, 
double walls with insulation made out of sawdust. And here's some ice tools that were located on the property, except this one's long like gone. But ice pick, saw, chisel, and tongs. They cut their own ice until the advent of electricity. Uh, we're going to end up here with our 19th century farm life okay? um, showing the never ending task. Uh, feeding eight fireplaces, later on feeding wood stoves with wood. Uh, this is a nice little buck saw from the collection and uh, uh, a nice small camp buck that you use for the kind of logs that you would be uh, utilizing for firewood rather than a mill. Okay, now uh, we're going to uh, stop the, start the clock again. Um, that we stopped a few minutes ago. And we're going to uh, visit Lucia Darling, who is obviously eight years old in 18, where does it say, 1841. And uh, why is she here? Because it turns out that she, uh, according to Don's findings, uh, was the one that owned the Darling House for a number of years, from 1873 until uh, 1905. Uh, again, this is something we're going to have to research as far as land records, but this is suggested by, uh, by <coughs> an examination of the tax records. She seems to have a house, but very little land. We think the land may now be associated with the James Darwin house, and the farming is still taking place, but uh, Lucia is... Uh, is not doing any extensive farming on her 10 acres or, or whatever she has over the years. <coughs> uh, this is the Darling House, as I promised you, in 1870s or 80s, whenever this was taken, uh, and it's red. No doubt about it. This is a, this is not the present porch. It's a much simpler porch. Probably the, the present porch was uh, during Lucia's time. That's my theory anyway. Certainly the timing is right. As a design of the porch. Uh, this map from uh, 1892 by Donald Mitchell is one of the few things we have graphic of a graphic nature to indicate the agrarian pursuits on the farm at this time. And this shows the house, um, the the bar, probably the horse barn, although they're not they're connected there. A large barn on the west side of the road. To so orient yourself, by the way, this is when you go turn by. Uh, Clark Road. This is the James Darling house that we saw earlier. Uh, we think that at this time Lucia probably had just a very small area. Uh, one thing you might want to note here is uh, the little brook that goes. Remember we looked at the culvert there. The other thing is, see, the one, uh, the, the two agrarian things we can tell from this map are one, the uh, the orchard in the back of the house, going, which goes right back to the earliest days. And there certainly seems to be a line of sugar makers along the road. Uh, whether these were utilized for uh, um, tapping or not, I don't know, but it, it certainly seems likely to me. Uh, Lucia, I, I put this in here just because I figured you were tired of black and white stuff. And uh, probably Lucia had flower gardens in much the same area that we have them today. Um, we're going to find later on that uh, when we get the Bernice Ball this time, we're going to find the the same peonies uh, in about the same area. Uh, this, of course, is, is taken uh, recently. I don't know this one not mm -hmm. Well, it's pretty nice anyway. <laughs> Lucia did have um, usually a cow or two, but we're talking about, with one or two cows, you're talking about just for your home consumption. In the early days, uh, Thomas Darling had, in the upper 20s, from what we found, at no time in the history of the Darling House was there uh, as many as 30 cows on the farm. Never. So the Thomas Darling House, the Thomas Darling Farm, never went through the evolution to a uh, one kind of monoculture uh, of dairying and using the money from dairy products to purchase the other things that were needed. Okay, we're going to move on now to uh, G. Halston Bishop. Uh, he takes over the property in, in uh, 1905, and 
we're not sure exactly how he does it, but he pulls together the land so that the Darling House now has more than 100 acres, acres with it, probably something around 150 acres, very similar to what it has today. Uh, he also builds up the uh, uh, dairy herd again to, I think, 27 was the highest that he had, and uh, this is starting in 1905. Probably something, this is probably about what the house looked like around the turn of the century. Uh, no automobile had ever gone by it at this time. You'll notice the wagon lots. And now the house is white. Now in that, and it also has the Victorian porch. Uh, kind of today. There's uh, Mr. Bishop inside the uh, barnyard on the west side of the road. Very prominent is uh, in most of these old photographs. There's a lot of these in the house. Is the um, is a ridge. And you know we've never done anything with these photos, but it's really an important part of the uh, history of the property. I believe this probably these double poles indicate that this was the transition from having the smaller, older poles for telephone lines to the uh, new poles for electricity. And when electricity went through here, I don't know. That would be interesting to, to find out. Was he related to the diary? Uh, yes. Do you want to explain how? Because you're uh, more conversant with the, the his, darling. His mother and father Bishop. were Charles Bishop and Mary Ann. Darling. Mary Ann Mary Darling. And Mary Ann was, I think, a sister to Lucia. Yes. Sure. I believe so. We could go back, but we're, we're just make it longer <laughs> before we get refreshed. It gets more difficult. <laughs> Well, yeah, Don, uh, Don's done a, a good deal of research because he now has a bishop house, and you know there is there's definitely a <laughs> like Don. Right. So when he was doing this research, you know, he was really doing other stuff. Too. So we're not going to we're only going to give him half the credit. Well, do you happen to know when electricity went through this area? Do you have any idea? Probably around. That in Bethany, we got a little bit later, but uh, 15 or 20. So that yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were parts of Bethany that uh, that didn't get until later. I know Lower Downs Road. Uh, some of the areas there didn't get electricity. Uh, didn't there were not poles in the road until I think it was 1947, something like that. I can throw this in here, but we're going to talk about dairy. Um, while we were looking for photogenic subjects, uh, this was up in a beam in the barn and obviously had been there since this property ceased to be used for uh, dairy. Probably back in the, in the early 30s. And these are probably G. Halstead's uh, castle here. Uh, we assume it's on the west side of the road. It's difficult to tell exactly where that is. Bernice Baldwin, uh, who is G. Uh, Halstead Bishop's stepdaughter, and uh, this this is at a period uh, certainly before the advent of running water. There's our privy that we're still very proud of, our functioning privy. Uh, many of the photographs show a wooden sidewalk the sidewalk went right to the back door. You didn't get your feet wet if you were in a hurry. <laughs> um, this, this structure here was the pig house. The lower level is where Don had to crawl in for that uh, photograph of the trough. And of course, uh, we're, we're sure that uh, we're just outside the chicken coop and we're sure that chickens were raised here uh, throughout the history of the, of the house. G. Halston himself, sitting in the uh, uh, west parlor. Uh, it's kind of interesting because it gives us an idea of how was this property used in the 20s. Uh, was it set up as a museum like it is now? Obviously not. But many of the photographs, of which you're not going to see tonight, many of the photographs show uh, the, the pieces of furniture that were passed down through the family um, being continually utilized. For instance, this is kind of an, uh, an early uh, Lindsay Woolsey quilt. 
This desk in the back hall, to the best of my knowledge, and maybe somebody can correct me on this, I believe this is the one that uh, Bishop used uh, as tax collector. He was tax collector for many years. Uh, Ross, I'm going to look to you again. Do you know how many years he was tax collector? Have any idea of the parameters? Good, then I can say whatever I want. <laughs> Um, I know I've heard from people uh, associated with the, the class that uh, during very hard times when they had difficulties uh, paying their taxes, uh, he made it possible for some of the people down there, some of the farmers, to keep their land. So I think there's a, uh, I know among several families, there's a, there's a very good feelings toward the Darling, uh, Darling House and the, because of uh, G. Halstead's attitude. Back to the turnpike, again, the central feature of the farm. Um, the turnpike is improved. There's your that stone bridge is under there, believe me. Um, we do have electricity here now. We don't have the double pole, so this is probably a little bit later. Uh, but transport was changing. The, the, the change was dramatic. Uh, this not quite as well as we hope. We have a saddle. Uh, this is a side saddle. And this is G. Halston Bishop's uh, license plate. All of these things are in the barn. Uh, what are we not too subtly we're trying to give you the idea of a transition in transport. But it's more than a transition. It's a revolution. Because uh, my, uh, I, I've done some reading in the diaries of uh, Arthur Doolittle who was um, excellent diarist, and he notes, uh, he notes a great, uh, that this area was used, the, the turnpike was used for uh, stagecoaches. I know many of you think, think of stagecoaches as the old west and you watch movies and stuff, but uh, this was, there was a regular stagecoach line on here from, I'm trying to think, back in the 1820s I think it started. Uh, a journal kept by Tyler Davidson mentions in 1907, that, um, I can't remember the day, but in 1907, the last regular stagecoach ran between New Haven and Waterbury, ran up the Litchfield Turnpike. So as late as 1907, stagecoaches are using this. Ten years later, 1917, G. Halstead Bishop buys an automobile. Now that's a revolution. From stagecoach to automobile in a decade. Uh, a few years later, 1924, his horse, and then we, again we find this from our tax records, his, uh, he has no longer has any horses, no longer has any carriages, and now he's into the automobile. Maybe Washington here, we're not sure. So I see the on the ground, but he looks like he's ready to do something with that uh, uh, automobile from the front. the time where I usually run into the not having a clue why this is here. Why is this here? <laughs> you always use a picture of the house to show a transition. Okay. <laughs> I guess i got to find out what the transition is. <laughs> ah, there it is. Yeah. In 1932, G. Halston Bishop dies, and the property goes into his estate. His stepdaughter, Bernice, lives in the house and on the property until her death in 1972. And uh, here she is in front of the front of the house. She was her lawn mower. I don't think she did all of the duties, but it just, it's, uh, I, I think it's an interesting uh, little vignette. At the time that G. Halstead dies, all of the farm animals disappear from the tax records. So that's really the last time that this is a functioning farm for the family. Uh, probably more than that, uh, probably vegetable gardens are kept, and uh, certainly flower gardens are kept uh, by Miss Bishop, Miss Baldwin, rather. <laughs> no, I made a mistake and didn't catch one. It makes me worry that I may have made another. <laughs> a series of fortuitous circumstances came together, which allowed the town of Woodbridge. Foresighted people uh, were able to purchase the 150 acre parcel and the house and the old barns, <coughs> and preserve it and 
perpetuity, there's open space. Uh, with it, they got the old house, which they, I think, wisely entrusted to the Amity and Woodbridge Historical Society. Bernice Baldwin, who was alive at this time, donated all of her possessions, all of the family papers, all of the <coughs> tools, all of the furniture, everything that had belonged to the Darling family and had been preserved in the house for 200 years. Uh, this was donated to the Historical Society so that these things could remain together. At present, this is the only house in the only building, only structure in the town of Woodbridge that's on the National Register of Historic Places because of its arch uh, architectural and uh, historic significance. This scene of the uh, property on the western side of the road showing uh, the old stone walls that remain from the farm, the uh, early succession field uh, where you find red cedars growing up in the old fields, barberries, old barberries, things like this. This is where, where Don got a little artsy, but I let him get away with it. <laughs> Even though the uh, family no longer farmed after 1932, they did allow others to farm. Otherwise, the fields would have grown up. We would have seen nothing but woods, and we would have been the poorer for it. Uh, this, these fields are being utilized by Fred Shepherd, and uh, this view looking north of the James Darling House from the barn of the Thomas Darling House, uh, showing the corn stubble illustrates this Cattle are still being raised on the property. Nice Jersey cattle. The house itself is, uh, as a museum, uh, shows us the different periods of family occupancy. The 18th century, the 19th century Victorian. The kitchen of the Darling House, where food and products of the farm were prepared for the family for, for over two centuries. And the Darling House as it is today. Uh, this is not from a tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> this, is, uh, this is also not from an airplane. Not from an airplane, no. Don and I went up to the summit of West Rock and uh, to give you an idea of uh, what the Thomas Darling House looks like from this particular vantage point. And that's it. <laughs> get it nice and hot, and quench the rock with uh, cold water. And it would spall, it would crack. You wouldn't be able to break it all up, but you'd get it down and eventually you'd whittle it down to socks. When my husband was digging our well, there was a big rock in it, and he took old tires and put on it, just like you're saying, made a big fire, and then poured cold water on it. Pick up and pick up and chunks. That'll do it. Any other questions? I guess you all want 